Philosophical Society. I would like to welcome you to tonight's talk with Andrew Linnell, A Birth Among Ruins. And um, really looking forward to this. And I'm going to uh, light a candle and just share a verse uh, before we get started with, with the lecture, the talk. This is from Rudolf Steiner. Um, I don't know where it's from. It's just one that I really like that I have written down. In the free being of man, the universe is gathered up. Then in the free resolve of your heart, take your own life in hand and you will find the world, the spirit of the world will find itself in you. So um, I wanted to just give a little introduction uh, for Andrew and start by saying that um, I've I met Andrew, well, I think, you know, at least that I remember um, about four years ago. Um, I joined a study group in Concord with, um, with Andrew, Rudolf Steiner study group. And um, we've had many wonderful conversations uh, over the years. And um, so more about Andrew, he is the co-founder of Mystech. He retired from a 42 year career in, in the computer industry in 2013. He is president of the Boston branch of the Anthroposophical Society and a member of the School for Spiritual Science. He's the father of three and author of two children's books, plus an art history book, The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance Leonardo. He is a CEO of Mystech, or the CEO of Mystech, and leads several study groups. He has published five study group guidebooks, a frequent lecture in the role of technology in human evolution, as well as the Christian mysteries. So, and I think you, you recently published another book. Um, is that right? That's right. It's called The Uncomfortable History of Christianity. Great. When, when did you finally, um, but that's very recent. I think it was the 27th of December. <laughs> oh, congratulations. I saw it on Amazon and I really want to read it. So thank you. Yeah. And there's a couple other, the, uh, the Mystech study guides are showing up just today. Oh, where on, on Amazon. Amazon? On Amazon as well. Yeah. Oh, great. So it's easy for people to get it. I like that. Good. Yeah, the study groups come, you know, starting up all around the world. So it was too difficult to try to figure out how to ship to people all around the world, made it easier. Leave it to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> well, good. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate this. Um, I'm looking forward to the talk. And um, hopefully the chat will work later. We'll be able to take questions and, um, you know, share thoughts via the chat and Andrew can answer. So fingers crossed. Well, let's see, there are four. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, so the chat is working, good. Right, and also there's the Q&A. Supposedly we should use the Q&A, but either one will work. We'll go back and forth checking both. Oh, okay. All right, good. That's good to know that's separate. I think I've always used the chat, so. All right. Well, here we are now in 2021 with only a few days left to our holy nights as we approach the 6th of January. 
I know yesterday, 13 of our local branch members got together under the theme of the human heart in its role, not only during these special days, but also throughout the year and in evolution itself. Today, some of you may have listened to Ross Rentia in yet another Zoom webinar. Some of you may be both happy about and weary from so many anthroposophical online webinars and meetings. And here we are again. So is the culture that we once knew falling into ruins? Now the Renaissance artists tried to use their paintings like this one to help to develop in the viewer as well as in themselves what Steiner called imagination. They did this through their art. Such paintings are full of symbolism and esoteric content. So over the next hour, we're going to tour what Renaissance painters had to say about the birth of Jesus and the birth of Christ. Okie doke. See, maybe it'll work if I do that. Okay. So <clears throat> there's different kinds of ruins. The first I'd like to point us to is seasonal. If you remember back when it was Michaelmas, the harvest was underway and we had the enjoyment of picking apples and the autumn leaves were colorful and wonderful to see, but they were falling. And eventually all of this nature fell down and now it's being drawn down into the earth. In a way we can say nature right now is in ruins. But there are also development phases in, in uh, movements. They'll have the swing of a pendulum and what seem like good movements will later run out of steam and turn into not so good movements. And this is all part of our consciousness soul age, but we're also in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age. In each of these, all such things come to ruins. So I'd like you to picture yourself in Palestine around 4 BC. Herod is ruling and he's a sort of puppet ruler within the Roman Empire. The Jewish nation has been defeated and Judaism is going to be tolerated until 70 AD when the failed revolt will cause all the Jews to be expelled from Palestine. And that will continue until right after World War II. We may feel with COVID that we have entered a kind of winter, one that has lots of death and is bringing ruins to life as we once knew it. Just as an aside, I, I have a feeling that many companies are not going to go back to having their employees come into the office. I, I think we'll find that a lot of things will have moved to being online going forward. We're in a winter of the seasons. We're in a winter of civilization. We're in a winter of evolution. We're in a winter for the physical body and for the soul and perhaps for the spirit. But this shall pass. This winter may get worse before spring shall come, but already the days are getting longer. And thus we come to Epiphany. Now our featured artist for tonight will be Botticelli, born Alessandro de Mariano Filippi in Florence in 1445. He was first apprenticed to a goldsmith then he was enrolled in Andrea del Veraccio's art school in Florence, where Leonardo da Vinci was one of his other apprentices there. Later, he continued his own studies with the painter Fra 
Filippo Lippi, Lippi's own son, Filippino, would later become one of Botticelli's students. Although he was one of the most individual painters of the Italian Renaissance, Sandro Botticelli remained little known for centuries after his death. Eventually, his work was rediscovered late in the 19th century by a group of English artists known as the Pre-Raphaelites. I'll read a quote from Steiner. Botticelli, in a certain respect, is most decidedly a painter of the life of soul. Yet he again emancipates within the life of the soul the human from that general religious feeling that pervades the work of earlier painters, such as Fra Angelico. Botticelli emancipates the human, working once more toward a certain naturalism in the expression of the soul. And now speaking of religious feeling, let me just also mention that there was a gentleman, a Dominican friar named Savron Arola. Savron Arola came to Florence in 1481-82, and he was expected to bring problems for the artist because they knew of him from their sister city, uh, Ferrara in Italy. And indeed, when he came, he preached um, a way uh, that he said was not just inspired, but that he saw visions of the Madonna and that she was the one telling him what to say and do to bring about the new Jerusalem into Florence. And so his mobs would gather up um, different art that they considered vain and would burn it in the town square. Botticelli lost some of his paintings. Since he stayed in Florence for his whole life, Botticelli uh, was quite aware and afraid of Savonarola and his mobs. So um, another thing to bring up is that <clears throat> There were secret schools at this time. We, are, we know that the, uh, for example, the Rosicrucians had already begun, but there were also before this, the Templar Knights and the Cathars, both of them had been eliminated uh, through very cruel means. And um, we also have perhaps other secret schools, uh, schools that studied the Kabbalah and perhaps other texts. Um, we also have Freemasonry uh, flowing back uh, in from Scotland, for example, and they had their own set of secrets. And so also I forgot to mention um, there was uh, a gentleman by the name of George Gamistus Plethon, who brought to Florence uh, a, a set of lectures and a trunk full of esoteric books. And this inspired the Platonic Academy of Florence. So here we see the stealing of the Oratory of San Andrea in Ravenna. This is not a painting, rather, this was done with the lost art of mosaics in the late 50s century. And I want you to remember that fifth century. From the top going clockwise, we have the lion, then the eagle, then the angel man, and then the bull. Here I have arranged these four segments so that you can see each of them upright. These four images represent the four gospel writers. Given that they all have wings, this artist was depicting these as the cosmic inspiration for their respective gospel writer, namely for Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark. These four depictions also represent the four zodiac signs of Aquarius, Taurus, Scorpio, and Leo. These are also the four group souls to which humans belong during the first 
four ages of the Atlantean epic. Each of the four gospel writers were assigned one of the four group souls. Matthew and Luke offered genealogies for the child described in their gospel. Matthew declares up front that he was writing about Jesus Christ. He begins with a genealogy after introducing Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now his genealogy is traced starting with Abraham, who Matthew says begat Isaac and Isaac begat Judah and so on and so on all the way down to Jesus. Thus Matthew's genealogy begins with Father Abraham, and traces the lineage down to Joseph, who begot Jesus. So we have this bloodline from Abraham. In contrast, Luke's genealogy begins with Jesus and traces backwards to Adam, who was the son of God. He oddly says that Jesus was, and this is the quote, a son, as was supposed, of Joseph, end quote. We'll try to explain that a little later. Now, Luke was writing to one named Theophilus, which means literally one who loves God. He declares himself to be among the eyewitnesses and servants of the Logos. Pre-Renaissance painters were aware of the apocryphal books that were not included in the Bible. Now, one such apocryphal book was the Gospel of James that tells the story of Mary and her parents, Joachim and Anna. According to James, the couple were a disgrace because throughout their years, they had had no children. Now, one day, Joachim was thereby banished from the temple. He fled into the mountains and those who know what that means esoterically can smile, there an angel appeared and told him that his sacrifice was accepted and his wife Anna was now pregnant. Joachim rushed back to Jerusalem. The angel had also appeared to Anna to tell her the news and bid her to go to the city's golden gate to greet her husband. This fresco shows the scene when the couple met. James goes on to tell how Mary's parents, while advanced in age, gave her to the temple to be raised there as one of the temple virgins. But when Mary reached puberty, she could no longer remain with the pure virgins of the temple. She had to be given away in marriage. The priest collected rods from the available men, and the rod of the older man, Joseph, was the first to flower, indicating that God wanted for Mary to be wedded to him. With this background, we can now pick up Luke's story with his Annunciation to Mary. This is a fresco by Giotto. In holy books, the task to announce what is to come falls to the archangel Gabriel. Giotto made brilliant use of an archway at the Scrovegni Chapel. He used this odd space to show the spiritual world on one side of the archway and how it can speak to us. Here Gabriel speaks to Mary in the physical world and she is depicted on the other side of the archway. This was painted largely by the young Leonardo da Vinci under supervision of his teacher, and we've heard this name, Andrea del Verraccio. Given this setting at the edge of a stone house with a walled garden, what would you say about the symbolism of where and how this Annunciation took place? Now, I'll pose a biblical question for you. Is this Annunciation part of the Gospel of Luke or of Matthew? Many no longer know. This scene is in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 39, and here's a part of that. And in the sixth month 
of Elizabeth pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. One of the more popular artists studied by the students at Ferraccio's school was Fra Angelico, who is best known for his fresco paintings in the convent of San Marco in Florence. This is one of four Annunciation paintings he completed, and perhaps there are more unknown ones. Now, two exist at this convent. Note the hands of the sun spirit releasing the dove into the sunbeam that shines upon Mary. It's fascinating what Steiner has to say about the sunbeam, but we don't have time to go into that today. But Fra Angelico felt a connection of this coming child as the redemption for what happened in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. Thus, for him, it made sense that Luke would trace the ancestry back to Adam, even to Adam before the fall. Luke began his gospel not with the birth of Jesus, but with the birth of John the Baptist. As Luke began his story, he gave us a time frame hint by saying, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. At that time, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was working as a temple priest. Keep that in mind, a priest. John's mother, Elizabeth, was descended from Aaron, the high priest of earlier times. Like Jacob and Anna, Zechariah and Elizabeth had had no children and were now past childbearing years. Now time passes some more. We no longer know if Herod is still alive when the story described a temple scene. From the right side of the incense smoke around the altar, Gabriel spoke to Zechariah and declared that the couple would have a son who was to be named John, and he will go, and this is important, with the spirit and power of Elijah. This was no metaphor. And to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord, Zechariah asked how he can be sure he said, I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. But because of this doubt, he was made mute. When his service, immediately he was made mute. When his service in the temple completed, and we don't know if this was several days, several weeks, even months later, he returned home. After this, Elizabeth became pregnant. Luke does not tell us where the parents of John the Baptist lived, but six months later in Nazareth where Mary lived, Gabriel came to her to announce that she, although a virgin, will have a child. Gabriel adds, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. Mary, who was now just pregnant, goes to visit her relative Elizabeth, who, as we heard, was six months pregnant. The walking distance could not have been far. When Elizabeth heard Mary's salutation, the babe leapt in her womb, and it says, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she spake out with a loud voice, saying, As soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Now Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home just before Elizabeth gave birth. Interestingly, Zechariah 
could speak again after their child was born and properly named John. Six months later, Mary gave birth to her Jesus. This is often cited for why John's birth is put on June 25th, six months prior. Here we see the scene from Luke of the shepherd's visit as painted by Giotto in the Cathedral of Assisi. Note Joseph taking a nap and the ox and ass keeping warm the babe who is in swaddling clothes. This scene, as I said, from Luke does not mention John the Baptist until Jesus is ready for baptism. Typically during the pre-Renaissance, we find that the births as described in Luke and Matthew were painted as separate scenes. Luke described the poor family from Nazareth that had to travel to Bethlehem to be taxed. A heavenly host invited nearby shepherds to come to witness the birth. No star leads them to the child, and Joseph is typically asleep to what is going on. The scene in Matthew's gospel is about kings who are led by a star. Their astrological wisdom has told them that a great king was to be born. Naturally, as they pass through the lands, including the lands of King Herod, they paid homage to its royalty. Herod was disturbed by their foretelling of a great king being born within his kingdom. Later, the three magi found the baby in a house in Bethlehem belonging to the descendants of the wise King Solomon. Here is Gentile de Fabriano's altarpiece, where he has combined the stories of Matthew and Luke. You see in the larger image on top, the adoration of the Magi from the Gospel of Matthew. Then in smaller images, we see along the bottom, the nativity scene from Luke, then the flight into Egypt, sorry, and finally the presentation in the temple back again to Luke. Let's take a closer look at the nativity scene from Luke in Fabriano's altarpiece. We see the infant laying on the ground, glowing in an egg-shaped aura. The ox and ass show that the infant is the source of light upon them. We look at the symbolism of ox and ass a bit later. Mary and Joseph have halos, but Joseph is asleep. And people say, perhaps after all the travel in the late hour, he needed the sleep. Yeah. In the hillside of the background, a spiritual being announces the birth to the shepherds. Now note that the building is the inn that had no room for them. They went to the stables, and the stables is a cave that you see behind the two animals. Note how different this scene feels. It is depicting the scene from the passage in Matthew that goes, and when they were come into the house, that's important, not into stables or cave, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And of course, those are all symbols which Steiner describes. I found on Christmas Day an article by a professor by the name of Estrada of Fuller Theological Seminary that appeared in the news, online news, and it claimed that, quote, the differences between Matthew and Luke are nearly impossible to reconcile. So going back to Luke's story, we come to the presentation of Jesus in the temple eight days after the birth. This scene is painted by Ambrogio Lorenz, Lorenzetti, and it was painted in 1342. It portrays the temple scene for the circumcision 
although this is at least a week after birth, there is no mention of Herod, no slaughter of innocents. And after this, the couple calmly returned to their humble home in Nazareth. In Luke's story, as I said, no escape into Egypt. Now, in this temple scene, Luke describes an individual by the name of Simeon. And I'll quote, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was a righteous and devout man. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit then that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Now, according to Steiner, this scene was the karmic fulfillment of an individual by the name of Asita, who in the story of Bhuta had wanted to witness him, but had died too soon. His spiritual sight recognized in this life the near Manakaya of the Gautama Buddha rang out from this child. There was also present the elderly prophetess, Anna, who you see here. She spoke about the future role of this child. So <clears throat> we've been talking about Matthew and Luke. Here you can see a chart that distinguishes uh, the two stories. And I'll just like to point out a couple things from here. One is kingly Matthew, one is priestly Luke. In one, the angel or archangel speaks to Joseph and the other to Mary. Their original home in Matthew, it's Bethlehem. In Luke, it's Nazareth. And in Matthew, Jesus will have four brothers and two sisters, whereas in Luke, he's an only child. Now remember that both Mark and John start their gospel with the baptism. Here, Filipino Lippi tried to combine both stories by depicting the visit of the Magi as happening at the stables as described in Luke. Note the stables are in ruins, perhaps to emphasize the earthly poverty of the couple. Was Lippi also trying to establish by the ruins a strong contrast between this poor family and the rich kings? Or perhaps that the glorious ancient wisdom depict, depicted by the kings had reached its ruins and must now give way to the new represented by this child. Here is another example of an early Renaissance painting of the adoration, this time, yes, by Fra Angelico. His adoration was done also with his student, Filippo Lippi, the father of Filippino, whose adoration we just saw. Florentine artists knew the adoration scene well. Florence had an annual festival complete with a costume parade that reenacted the adoration of the Magi. In fact, the three Medici brothers are often used as the three kings. And note the throng of people depicted. The second director of London's National Gallery of Art, John Walker, wrote in his large work that <clears throat> this painting was among the greatest Florentine paintings in the world. It is the climax of beauty, a summary in itself of the whole evolution of the Italian schools of painting in the first half of the 15th century, for it stands at a crossroad of art. The old style, the gay, colorful, fairy tale painting of the Middle Ages is ending. You could even say it's in ruins, in an outburst of splendor. And the new style, scientific and observation, studious in anatomy and perspective, and realistic in its portrayal of life, 
is beginning its development. Now, I'd also like you to note the peacock on the roof of the stables. We see that symbolism of the raised peacock here as well. For the peacock feathers have many eyes, suggesting spiritual eyes by this symbol. In a moment, we'll look at the symbolism of ox and ass, but note that neither of these animals appear in this painting. This adoration is by Sandro Botticelli. We heard earlier that he was in the apprenticeship with Leonardo of Braccio School. He was seven years older than Leonardo, but Leonardo joined at a very young age. So they certainly knew each other. Now, what is Botticelli saying in depicting this background? Perhaps Rome was in ruins, but so was Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. And the Black Plague had ruined medieval life. Was he feeling that Renaissance life was like a new life being born among such ruins? Botticelli painted several adorations. This one, three years later, also shows this birth as happening among ruins. Why? It also shows Botticelli in his own painting. But again, it shows no ox nor an ass. This one was completed in 1476. There are a total of seven known adoration paintings by Botticelli, each one very different, but each showing ruins. Note that the crowd size is increasing. Still no ox and no ass. This begins to have something of a combination because behind Mary and Joseph is a cave. The house stands sort of in front of that cave. Botticelli painted this adoration in the year Leonardo left Florence for Milan, that is in 1482. The cave is no longer depicted, but now ox and ass make an appearance. Clearly he felt it appropriate to depict this birth of Jesus among ruins, but not to stray too far into what could be deemed heresy. And that is because of the individual and his mob that we heard, Savonarola. Four years later, Botticelli resuming his adoration among ruins, painted this. This time the couple has an encampment in front of the mouth of a cave, a tabernacle. No ox, no ass. What is he trying to tell us by depicting such a huge throng of people? Is he saying that the three magi traveled with a large entourage? Or that Christ was to come for everyone, for every human being? Lastly, I'd like you to note the rock areas in the foreground that could also be clouds, a kind of indication of the spiritualization of the rock. Why have these artists depicted the birth among ruins? We just heard some possible answers. The Roman Empire was in ruins. Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire was in ruins. Well, half of Christianity had fallen to the Ottomans with the loss of the Byzantine Empire just a few years earlier. And we know that the Roman church was steeped in corruption and I go into that in that book that Jennifer was mentioning, uh, The Uncomfortable History of Christianity. But anyway, Italy had been reduced to warring city-states. Its society was in ruins after the Black Plague. Looking even farther back in time, we can say the glorious ancient mysteries 
had long been left in ruins. In their assessment of their contemporary times, did those of the early Renaissance feel that life in general was in ruins and that they had a strong desire for something new? St. Francis and others had tried and failed to overcome the corruption in the church. Just prior to the Renaissance, there had been three popes at one time. Evolution progresses as we heard in cycles or seasons. Spring will follow the ruins left by winter. Let's return to the birth story in Matthew. After finding Jesus, the three kings are warned not to return to Herod. This fresco by Giotto shows why the slaughter of all children two years and younger as decreed by King Herod, who worried that there was a child who would take his throne from him or from his sons. This painting by Matteo di Giovanni also shows the slaughter of the innocents and look how he has depicted King Herod. This fresco by Giotto shows the scene from Matthew of the couple fleeing the slaughter by going to Egypt. In Matthew, the angel speaks to Joseph. And it's interesting to ask, why did they go to Egypt? Well, this map shows us the path, number four, that was likely taken from Bethlehem to Egypt. An ass had carried the pregnant Mary to Bethlehem from Nazareth along path number one. Now it will carry her and the child to Egypt for safekeeping. Rudolf Steiner adds that by going to Egypt, this child could gather into itself the wisdom of the Egyptian post-Atlantean cultural age. Now, if these gospels are telling us just different facts of one story, then we run into a problem that occurs eight days after the birth. Path two was taken to go to the temple in Jerusalem for Jesus to be circumcised. After that, Matthew has him travel back to Bethlehem, indicated by path number three, while Luke has them go directly back to Nazareth along path number one. Only in the story of Luke do the ox and ass appear. When Jesus is placed in a feed box, a manger, then the breath of the animals could warm the baby on that cold night. But many an artist portrayed ox and ass in their adoration paintings. Symbolism was very important during the early Renaissance, and so was confusion about these two stories being one story. This confusion remains in place in our times. What do you suppose the ox and ass represented as symbols in Luke's story? The book of Isaiah says, the ox knows its owner and the ass its master's stall. The bull or ox has symbolized strength. The ass was the animal of Saturn, of cosmic memory and humility. We might turn to Mithraism and associate the ox with the bull within one's soul life that needs to be overcome. The second century Afri African writer, Lucius Apolseus wrote an esoteric book by the title, The Golden Ass, which is a story of a human who has been metamorphosed into the body of an ass, but finds liberation through the Egyptian initiation rites of Isis and its Apis bull. Shakespeare played with this in a Midsummer Night's Dream, when Bottom's head is transformed by Puck into that of an ass. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he rode on an ass or donkey. And so too did the Greek god of technology when he rode back to Olympus, that is, upon an ass. 
So there's something amazing about this ox and ass and symbolism that I think we don't fully understand. But let's go back to Matthew and look at Joseph's decision as to when it would be safe to return from Egypt. It was soon after the family had arrived in Egypt and soon after the slaughter of the innocents that King Herod died. Some historians place Herod's death in 4 BC and others in 1 BC. Herod's kingdom was then divided up among his sons, as shown in this map. Note that all these kingdoms were under Roman rule. Now, Herod's son Archelaus is mentioned in Matthew as being as cruel as his father. Had word reached Archelaus that the parents of the boy who had been visited by the Magi had returned from Egypt, he likely would have sent soldiers to kill them. So the parents wisely decided not to return to their residence in Bethlehem, but to head farther north where they might be safe. Thus, Matthew concludes with this statement, so that he will be called a Nazarene. So back to this map, we see a possible path from Egypt to Nazareth, thereby thereby avoiding Jerusalem altogether. What might Matthew have meant by Jesus being called a Nazarene? Merely that he was from there? Ah, so Steiner helps us out. He says that the descendants of Jesse, or it could be pronounced Yesi, they, he, well, Jesse or Yesi, was the father of King David, and his descendants were known as Yassines or Essenes. Along with the Sadducees and Pharisees, they were one of three philosophical approaches to Judaism. In chapter eight of his book, The Jewish War, Flavius writes, now this is in the first century, so he's a historian in the first century, and he wrote, for there are three philosophical sects among the Jews, the followers of the first of which are the Pharisees, of the second, the Sadducees, and the third sect, which pertains to a severe discipline, are called Essenes. These last are Jews by birth and seem to have a greater affection for each other than the other sects have. The Essenes have colonies. Now, their famous one was Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947. But they had other colonies, and one was in Nazareth. Steiner re revealed that their secrets and teachings were derived from Yeshu ben Pandira. And these were propagated and written down by his pupil, Matthai or Matthew, yes, the author of that gospel. And John the Baptist was an Essene. Their strict and strenuous rules meant no alcohol. And it meant being complete vegetarians and no haircutting. And the reason for these rules were meant to lead to seership. The next event recorded in the Gospels is from Luke, and it tells us that the family goes annually to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. They travel with many others from Nazareth. After it concluded, while walking back home from Jerusalem, they discover that they must have left their 12-year-old son back in the city. So they quickly return, and finally, after three more days, they find him in the temple conversing with its doctors. Let's listen to their conversation. As his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou dealt with us in this way? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee for over three days with much sorrowing. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me. Did you not know 
that it was necessary for me to be here in my father's house at this time. So what is Lorini, the painter here, telling us by this hand gesture? that the two must become one. This Jesus among the doctors painted by Luini presents us with that theme, which is found in several ancient texts. In thine hand, the two messiahs will become one. Yes, the ancient texts talk about two messiahs, coming, and then a merging of these. So this merging takes place within the Holy of the Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem. And because of this merger, the eye of Matthew's Jesus now lived within the bodily sheath of the Luke Jesus. This helps us to explain why Luke's genealogy begins with, as I said before, Jesus was a son, as was supposed, of Joseph. This Jesus among the doctors is by Bernardino de Beto, also known as Pinturicchio. On the right, we see Joseph and Mary entering the scene. As they transformed Jesus, his parents were amazed at his newfound knowledge and wisdom. The books of the learned doctors have been thrown on the ground, symbolic that their knowledge fades in the face of this 12-year-old boy. Note his halo with a red cross inscribed. We can look even closer to learn more. First notice the hand gesture. It too says the two will become one. Next, notice the feet. On our right, the child with a halo is standing on the earth barefoot. On the left, both children's feet are lifted off the earth, one by socks, one by shoes. Of these two children, one is well-dressed, the other poorly dressed. Notice the colors of the well-dressed boy, his green and magenta top with gold undershirt. He has a blue bound book in hand, while the other has a white sack with something inside that might be a book. They are departing. They represent the two Jesus children as they once were, but no longer will be. So uh, I think this is misplaced here. I'm sorry about that. But uh, this was the, there to bring up the differences in the two and the ox and the ass. Sorry. Um, this was supposed to be the next painting. Uh, next slide. So we see that the, these two boys are framed by five individuals. Their clothing colors go from left to right, black, blue, gold, then this green and magenta, and in the fifth, a royal purple. Now each of the four carry an object in their hand. The four facing the two children represent the physical black, soma and blue, psyche and gold, and Numa in the rose green. This fifth is the hierophant who performed the spiritual merging of these two within the Holy of the Holies. And the result was the boy with the halo. Could the story of Cain and Abel be related? For Abel sacrificed what the gods knew, that is, from the living. Whereas Cain sacrificed from his own efforts, working upon the earth and upon the lifeless. In a sort of fit of jealousy, Abel was killed by his half-brother, and his blood becomes, quote, in the earth, unquote, while Cain is set free. The karma of this had to be resolved before Christ could enter a human body, for that body needed to represent all of humanity. From Leviticus chapter 16, we learn about animal sacrifice as it once was practiced. 
And this is how two goats were brought to the temple for sacrifice. One, the scapegoat, was let go into the wilderness like Cain. The other goat was killed in the temple like Abel. And then its blood is poured out into the ground. When Judas kisses Christ and Christ is arrested and taken to Pilate, Pilate asks the crowd to choose one to set free. Should it be Christ or Bar Abbas, which means the son of the father? And today we pronounce it Barabbas, but it's Bar Abbas. There is much esoteric wisdom here. These lineages um, from Lemurian times persisted into the middle of the Atlantean epic. These four lineages of Cain, Abel, Eve, and Adam. <clears throat> At that time, the Abel lineage, known as the sons of God the Father, took wives from the lineage of Cain, known as the sons and daughters of men. So when Matthew says, Pilate washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it, then answered all the people and said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. You see, Christ became the sacrifice and Bar Abbas became the scapegoat. And so Christ's blood entered the earth as had Abel's. Now let us turn to Rudolf Steiner's short lecture cycle entitled The Fifth Gospel to Understand What This Merged Jesus, This Jesus of Nazareth Did from Age 12 until the baptism at age 30. And I'll do it really briefly. At this time, the ancient mysteries were fading into decadence and into ruins. With the eye of Zarathustra within, Jesus traveled as a late teen until he was 24. At first, he traveled in Palestine, then beyond. He came upon Mithraism, which was spreading through the Roman world. He experienced pagan rituals and the ruins of the ancient mysteries. Everywhere he witnessed the decadence and the demons that were merging with the faithful. For him, this was a most bitter experience. He found that the call of the back call, that is the daughter voice from heaven had ceased. It meant no more inspiration, no more prophecy for the Jewish nation. In one event though, when he was 24 at a pagan altar, he finally did hear the bath call speak. And this is what it said. Aum, amen, evil rules, witness the severing eye, selfhood's guilt by others owed. In daily bread now felt, in which heaven's will be not done. For man deserted your kingdom and forgot your names, you fathers in the heavens. Like the Buddha, he deeply observed human misery as the being Jesus of Nazareth. He went on to live within the Essene community of Nazareth from age 24 to at least 28 and perhaps beyond. One day he heard Buddha say, quote, if my teaching as it is, is completely fulfilled, then all men on earth must be like the Essenes, but that cannot be. That was the error in my teaching. The Essenes can only progress if they separate themselves from the rest of humanity. Yet these other human souls must be there 
for them. The fulfillment of my teaching would mean nothing but a scenes, but that cannot be, end quote. After this, Jesus experienced Lucifer and Araman fleeing from the gates of the Essene community. He sought out the wisdom of Hillel, whose words deeply affected Jesus in these words. Don't separate yourself from society, but live and work within it, end quote. And I think that applies today. Then he comes with all these sorrows and concerns to his mother, Mary. They have a deep discussion that loosens his bodily constitutions. Even his siblings thought he had gone mad when he got up and left to wander to the Jordan River. We've seen that the Matthew Jesus was born in either 4 or 1 BC, and the Luke Jesus was born in 1 AD. Then, when the Luke Jesus was 12 years old, something of these two lineages was merged in the temple. Then we heard about some of the life of this merged Jesus until he became 30 years old or so. So this tells us about Jesus, but it, does it tell us about when Jesus when, sorry, when Christ was born? Early Christianity's theology is dismissed today as childish concepts, perhaps with a bit of arrogance. Early Christians were far from uniform, though, in their beliefs. For many of the early Christians, Christ entered Jesus at the baptism when he was 30 years old. The ancient mysteries had offered wisdom of the coming of the Son God, that is the cosmic Christ. They placed the birth of Christ at the baptism when the cosmic Christ united with Jesus of Nazareth. After three years, Christ would fully penetrate this body, even into the bones. And thus, when he experienced death, he fully became man and his bones were not broken. Here we see the sun god depicted in pottery from ancient Greece. In Greek mythology, Helios was known as the sun god. He was beardless and drove his chariot across the heavens each day. In Persian lore, he was also known as Ahura Mazdao, and in Egyptian as Ra. Was this behind the words, I am the light of the world? This image was found in a Christian tomb of July in the Vatican necropolis located in Rome. It is an example of early Christian art showing Christ as the unconquered sun god. It is also interesting that the concept of Christ holding the whole earth in his hand was also painted by Leonardo in his Salvatore Mundi. Much of the early Christian world were followers of Arius. And for Arian Christians, the birth of Christ was at the baptism. Here you see one of their sealing mosaics from Ravenna. Out of the mouth of the dove, a watery element is pouring into this Jesus of Nazareth. The other being present here is the God of the River Jordan. And note, the source of the river is what is flowing out of his jug. Here we see the earliest painting in which the young Leonardo took part. It is claimed that he painted the two angels on the other side of the river, that is the Jordan River or the River of Life. Leonardo is said to have painted the curls in the angel's hair. It is further mentioned that Veraccio felt surpassed by the young Leonardo in artistic skill with this painting. Note the staff of John and the hands of God that have released the Holy Spirit to descend to and remain upon this Jesus of Nazareth, these symbols. Is there biblical support for Jesus? I'm uh, sorry, for Christ birth happening at the baptism? Yes, there is. 
in Psalms, in the Old Testament, it predicts God will say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And so these words appeared in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. Even Professor Bart Ehrman, a contemporary today, and other contemporary scholars have found that in these ancient texts, in the pre-third century gospel texts, the words were similar. Luke chapter 3, verse 22, for example, in these ancient texts, had God's voice at the baptism saying, today I have begotten thee. But this was changed in later versions to, thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. We find similar statements in Paul's work. First, we'll hear Romans, which reads, now we're going to talk just about Jesus before the baptism. As to his human nature, Jesus was a descendant of David. And in his letter to Galatians, Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, and thus was not Christ at birth. And in the Shepherd of Hermas, a popular second century text, we find Jesus was a virtuous man who became filled with the Holy Spirit of the Son. And lastly, I'll show another one, Theodotus of, Byz of Byzantium, late second century, wrote, quote, Jesus was a man born of a virgin who lived like other pious men. At his baptism in the Jordan, the Christ came down upon the man Jesus in the likeness of a dove. Thirty years after painting his first adoration, Botticelli painted this scene with both the kings of Matthew's story and the shepherds of Luke's. Was this to avoid, avoid the Inquisition or Savonarola? And to, or to imply knowledge of a future merging, merger of these two. Gone are the ruins, well, at least for this painting. Although the name mystical nativity came from a later owner of this painting, it was indeed meant to be mystical. And we can hear that in the inscription at the top, gives us an indication of how Botticelli felt about his times being a kind of turning point. And the inscription reads, I, Alessandro, in the half time after the time, painted according to the 11th chapter of St. John in the second woe of the apocalypse during the release of the devil for three and a half years. Then, he shall be bound in the 12th chapter and shall see as in this picture. And we shall see as in this picture. So what shall we see? After winter will come spring. We are in difficult times. Is your soul able to give birth to a new spring? Those of you who heard Daniel Hapner and others speak about Christmas in the light of the reappearance of Christ in the etheric, or that is in the realm of life, will find this interesting that the finding of Isis, that is the new Isis, the divine Sophia, whom man must find if the Christ power that is his since the mystery of Golgotha, is to become alive, completely alive. That is to say, filled with light within him. Then we can behold the mother, the divine virgin Sophia. In regard to the evolution of humanity, we must at all times feel able to say to ourselves, 
all development takes its course in such a way that wherever what has been created becomes a ruin. We know that out of the ruins, new life will always blossom forth. It is connected with the fact that the human soul can be satisfied after all, even animated in viewing imperfections, if not so much in viewing small imperfections, nonetheless, in viewing the large imperfections where creative activity on account of its greatness dies in the execution. For in such dying forces, we surmise and finally recognize forces that prepare the future. And in the evening glow, there arises for us the premonition that the hope of the coming dawn is there. Anyone? <clears throat> now, I, well, sorry, I'd like to just say the social question that confronts humanity is terribly urgent. Fearful things have come about in recent times and the social problem becomes ever more and more threatening. Only those who are asleep in their souls can overlook this fact. Now, for those who don't realize it, I've been quoting Steiner on this slide and I'll continue quoting him, but that sounds like it could be any one of us speaking. Europe or America or the world, as regards its culture, threatens to become a heap of ruins. Nothing can raise it from its chaotic condition unless men find it possible once again to develop a true, real humanity in their common life. May your soul among the cultural ruins that you feel surrounding you be fructified to give birth to a new life that may come through anthroposophy in you. For if Christ were born in Bethlehem a thousand times and not in thee, then art thou lost eternally. I'm showing you now the two books that are available on Amazon, The Hidden Heretic of the Renaissance and The Uncomfortable History of Christianity. And I will put up, probably not tonight, but sometime tomorrow at the website you see there, thechristianmysteries.com, if you want to look at these slides some more. So we will now move on to questions for that any of you may have. And if you can, um, you can put them into um, the chat or the Q&A. And um, I will uh, look at the Q&A and if, um, Jennifer, if you can look at the chat and read to me anything that shows up in the chat and I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. That sounds good. So any thoughts, questions, concerns, <laughs> inspirations? Andrew, do you want to put um, the stop doing the screen share and put your face back up? Sure. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Means I should be here too somewhere. <laughs> there we go. Sometimes it takes people a little bit to get their questions in. Yep, sometimes does. Okay, so um, this is from Barbara Martin. Andrew, this talk was so fact-filled that it has, has, will be impossible to keep 
it all inside me. Can you give this talk again next Saturday? <laughs> next Sunday, sorry. No, I cannot, uh, but thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that hyperbole and uh, all your appreciation. Um, yeah, um, maybe next Holy Nights. Um, I never like to give the same talk twice. So this, those of you, and I don't think there's anybody, but if, the, if any of you were on the talk I gave to, for Chicago, this is still a different talk than I gave that night. Is the last Botticelli, in the last Botticelli, it looks as though, and this is from Veronica, as though the feminine beings have lost crowns. Feminine beings have lost crowns. Hmm. I guess I'm not quite sure. Um, by the last Botticelli, I'm going back. Um, it's hard to get all the way back. That was quite a few slides ago, I see. One more. Still not there yet. So um, let me is it this one that you had in mind, Veronica? And um and, and did you mean halos? Because Mary does have a halo here. It's very hard to see. And Joseph also has a halo here. But I'm sorry, it's very hard to see. But <laughs> what's disturbing in a way is I believe most of these are male figures here. But it's hard to tell for sure uh, because we can't get up close enough to see, but I believe most of these are male figures. In the crowd in the back, I'm sure there are female figures, but um, but the only one that would have a halo would be Mary. Um, so I guess I'm not sure you say it can't be Botticelli. So you must mean another painting. So um, maybe you can say, stop if I get there. <laughs> so um, somebody, Darlene had something in that painting. Um, is it also possible to identify which are the three kings? But um, I think that was the one that you were on previously. So uh, no, it's not possible, I, I think, um, to identify who the three kings are. This would be one. And my guess would be that this would be another, but I'm not sure who the third king would be. Um, it could be this one, it could be this one, it could be this one. I doubt it's this one, but um, you know, <laughs> we have also three standing here together, but no, actually there's five here. So it's hard to say who the three kings are in this. Um, and then Barbara says, um, was it the painting with the ladies dancing in the sky? Um, I think what you're referring to. And Veronica is saying yes. So this is the one you mean then, and let's, and so um, 
in the um, revelations, the crowns that you see here are, um, they toss their crowns. I, uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, I, I don't think they lose the crowns. They are willingly giving up their crowns, but I'm not, I don't recall the passage from Revelations at the moment where this comes from. So sorry about that. But this would be from the 11th chapter, as it says here, of Revelations. Anything else? Um, David says, thank you, Andrew. Great talk. Too much information for me to be able to formulate any questions right now. It's just well, good uh, to know that everybody's out there still. As a um, quick closing, then, I will give you all a little treat. I have to stop in just a, three minutes from now because I have another session coming up at nine o'clock tonight. But um, that'll give you a little bit of time, Jennifer, to do a closing, I hope. But um, if you, whoops, watch what's going on here. I'm sorry, I didn't get the some. So what you saw there was the child moving from this side all the way down, around, across, and back up again. So with that, <laughs> um, I will say good night to you and turn it back to Jennifer. Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. If you sign off, am I gonna, I think, I don't know if I'm gonna be disconnected to. Just um, to finish, I'll read, read the verse again. In the free being of man, the universe is gathered up. Then in the free resolve of your heart, Take your own life in hand, and you will find the world. The spirit of the world will find itself in you. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Andrew. That was really, really great. Thank you so much thank for being you. here with us and celebrating the Holy Nights together. Thank you all. Good night. And everybody. Holy good night. Nights. OK. Bye-bye. Bye now.